I've been thinking a lot about books lately. Liar. Don't, don't call me out on camera. <laughs> I just like to share some thoughts with you. You are my local expert on books. Mm, I've read them all. What is a book? I think it's something edible. I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm really trying hard. If you were to try a little bit harder, uh -huh. what is a book? It would not be edible, I think, if I tried a little bit harder, because I think it's made from trees. Isn't fruit made from trees? And that's edible. Ah! I have to ask this because it's so rare that I meet someone who has read all of the books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have to ask, how many of those books are good? Let, let's qualify good. Is good, eh, I'm not mad I read that. Or is good like, I'm going to remember this a long time. How about something in between? How about, I'm going to remember that I was not mad about reading this. Uh-huh. About a third of them. I feel like books are far too easily made and published. I want you to explain publishing to me. I believe that publishing is when you take someone else's writing and distribute it across some sort of mass system involving paper or some sort of digital paper. Okay. I think. <laughs> that is that is a description. The reason I ask <laughs> is because you said books are published far too easily. And I mm. just think that you offended every writer in your audience by saying that. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> If I, if I was to reword my statement, probably a lot of stuff not worth publishing gets published a lot more than, than it should. <laughs> is that a sentence? Okay, so tell me, tell me what you deem as not worth publishing. This is genuinely interesting to me. In, in my, um, my pensiveness about books, I stumbled upon something that I'm not sure is worth publishing or not. Kissing the coronavirus. What's that? It's porn with the coronavirus. As in like the actual virus is performing sex acts or people with coronavirus? She's a scientist and there was a chemical spill and it turned into a sexy hot man who's green. What's your problem? No problem, I'm, I'm invested. That's your next book. I stumbled upon a book that is allegedly widely regarded to be the worst fantasy book ever written. Uh, it is called The Eye of Argon. Have you heard of it? I have heard of it. Have you ever taken part in a reading of The Eye of Argon? I have not. I've tried to read it and it hurts my mind. <laughs> Just for some context, this was a book written in the 1970s by author Jim Theus, I believe, and he was 16 years old at the time. It's only 78 pages and you can't get through it. Let's, let's, let's not judge me too quickly before you've seen the words that comprise this book. I'd like to say that the description on the back of the book doesn't tell you anything about the story. What it says is, this is not a hoax. Jim Theus was a real person who wrote The Eye of Argon in all seriousness. <laughs> What I've managed to decipher is it's like a Conan the Barbarian style story. Okay. Starring our protagonist named Grignir. Ooh. G-R-I-G-N-R. -R. I'm into it. Let's go. Let's go. I'm also dyslexic. I think that makes it easier in this particular case. I don't know what that first word is. Consciousness. Consciousness? Is that consciousness? <laughs> We're one word oh, into it and you've already stopped. <laughs> Cut all this. That's not, that's not real content. Consciousness returned to Gringer in stigmatic pools as his mind gradually cleared of the cobwebs cluttering his inner recesses. Yet the stigain cloud of charcoal <laughs> ebony remained, an incompatible shield of blackness enchanted by the bleak absence of sound. He dickered. <laughs> <laughs> He dickered with the notion that he was dead and had descended or sunk. I don't know what your problem is. It's like a third grade reading level, man. Listening to you, uh, it actually inspires me and I'd like to read a bit more. So we're going to jump forward in the story <gasps> a bit. Are you going to read this next bit? Are we going back and forth? Uh, sure, I can read this next bit. Do it. There's a slender female. Eyeing a slender female crouched alone at a nearby bench, Grignir advanced, wishing to wholesomely occupy his time. The flickering torches cast weird shafts of luminescence dancing over the half-naked harlot of his choice. That's right. Her stringy orchard twines of hair swaying gracefully over the lank, <gasps> opaque nose <gasps> as she raised a half-drained mug to her pale red lips. Sexy. If you would like to do the dialogue of the uh, half-naked harlot. Oh yeah, it does say questioned the female. I like that there's quotes after so not only that, it says question the female, then question mark. It's not in the actual Questioned statement the that female? she makes. Questioned the female? <laughs> Thou hast need to occupy your time, barbarian. Questioned the female? Uh, is she talking again or is this someone else? It's her again. You can tell because after the statement, it says gasp the complying wench. <laughs> Got 
got it. From where do you come, barbarian? And by what are you called? Gasped the complying wench as Grigner smothered her lips with the blazing touch of his flaming mouth. Oh! What a scene. <laughs> when scenes like this are written, I love to try to imagine it down to the T. So like, imagine this woman <gasps> gasping something and then he just like attacks her with his flaming mouth. <laughs> and that's another thing. Like she's gasping while she's saying that dialogue. So it's like... <gasps> From where did you come from, Barbarian? Where did you come from? <laughs> well, she's half naked, I mean, and her hair is all fluttery, so. I mean, she is a complying wench. <laughs> she is complying. Do you know what the oldest book ever written is? Okay, I know, this isn't, I know this isn't a test or a quiz, but I do know this answer. Oh no, this is a test. You are being marked. Ah! According to some very quick Googling, the oldest book ever written is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah! Oh, I should have known that. It is so old that it was written on stone tablets. <sighs> I don't think writers these days really appreciate what it was like to be a writer 4,000 <laughs> years ago. Because I see this tablet and I'm like, shit me, stories would need to be incredibly <laughs> concise. You know, you can't have your flowery Tolkien-esque languages. You can't have your Jim Theus. Like, if you're writing The Eye of Argon on a tablet, it's just wench. It's not complying wench or mm. anything. Because every adjective you write, that's going to take you like an hour to chisel into the stone. Yeah, you either need a blazing touch or a flaming mouth. You cannot have both. Absolutely. I, I want to do a bit of hype. Uh, but I want to talk. I want to say words in the right order mm. and you're going to understand them. Okay. So we're going to take Murphy Napier. Okay. You're going back in time. 4,000 years. Your task is to write the story of your life. You've got one stone tablet. You might be able to fit like three sentences on there. What is the legacy that you're going to leave to the world? Am I making up a legacy? Because I will make up a legacy. You are going to be recognized as the very first author in human history. Okay. Obviously, I'm a pirate and I invented sailing. So at sentence one and two is I am a pirate. I invented sailing. What is your final sentence? <laughs> Do I only get three? You didn't give me those restrictions. You might be able to fit like three sentences on there. I'm just saying you've got a stone tablet. That's you more than don't three know how to how do it precisely. Words are on this thing. Yeah, but this was like a trained stone carver. I'm a You're trained stone carver. I'll put it in the story. You know what? I'll give you five sentences. I'm obviously a pirate. I invented sailing. I met a siren at sea. She drowned me. Now I drown sailors too. You came up with that very... I'm impressed. I'm impressed by your story. Thanks. Now you do yours. Liam was here. It wasn't very eventful. Very few people noticed. He spent most of his time carving this story. <laughs> Bye, Liam. <laughs> Oh, you didn't credit yourself. You won't be remembered by history. You That's forgot okay. to credit yourself. I will be known as the person who invented piracy and sailing. You will be known as the person who claimed to invent piracy if and sailing. If you write it down, it's true. If I've learned anything from the internet, it's that you need no resources. You need no proof. You just say it and it's true. I suppose you would then be the beginning of so many Wikipedia articles. Unknown compliant wench is everywhere all over Wikipedia. It's me. The very first written words in human history a half naked harlot <laughs> in there's like a specific building where they keep books i want to know did you spend a lot of time in libraries as a child i did spend a lot of time in libraries as a child i wasn't allowed to check books out of our library because of some stupid rule so i would go my mom would drop me off at the library and then she would go run errands or something and i would take a book that i wanted to read go into a conference room area that i knew no one used and then just hide out there and read until it was time to leave and then i would hide it in that room it's like an addict hiding their stash I, yeah so that has actually reminded me of a library story i had you said you weren't allowed to take out books my situation was the exact opposite my primary school forced us to borrow books every week and our library has two librarians, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is your stereotypical grumpy elderly woman, the kind who like just greets you not with words, but with a scowl. Uh. And the other one is a much younger, more chill woman who is like very proactive about getting kids to read. And uh, uh. she got me into a bit of trouble. <laughs> 
So she is so proactive that she goes around to all the students, recommends them books, and I, being the six-year-old, sure, I'll take it. So I put the book in my bag. You don't put it in the bag until it's been checked out? Correct. Mm. And this led to a situation. <laughs> so I approach the elderly lady at the counter, who again, you know, scowls at me in the traditional manner. I take out the book, and that's my mistake, because I take it out of the bag. She thinks that I'm returning the book. And I guess usually that wouldn't be such a problem, but then she flips through through the book and she finds a food stain and at that point she flips out well I mean I say flips out she flips out as quietly as she can because we're in a library after all with a harder scowl oh my god yeah the scowl <laughs> pierced my soul long story less long I actually get blamed for this food stain mm -hmm. I get banned from the library for a week and my teacher is brought in and told about this who had to give me this really patronizing talking to like Liam you shouldn't be eating while you're reading and because again I'm like an awkward six-year-old yeah. i'm not capable of explaining yeah. what just happened here so i just like sit there and go uh yeah okay. and uh from that moment on i just i don't think libraries were my friend what is your least favorite trope in books? I'm going to pick forced miscommunication. Like the soap opera style where you just don't say things and it leads to misconceptions. Oh, like, oh, he's obviously cheating. Yeah. You walk in on the last bit of a conversation and then you walk away and then they say the thing that you should have heard. Oh no, drama ensues. <laughs> it's like... Or the other way around. Like there was very important context in the first half of the sentence. Let's <laughs> say like, I don't want to kill Fred. And all you hear is kill Fred. <gasps> <laughs> I need to tell Fred. <laughs> like, it's a very Shakespearean sort of miscommunication. Right, right. Like, I, right. I wholeheartedly blame Shakespeare. We can blame Shakespeare for just about anything we want. Yeah. What, what are some recent human atrocities? Oh, my goodness. Miley's favorite trope is, I don't know what to call it. Maybe you do. Uh, but it's, it's the one where you can clearly tell that the main character is the author's self-insert. When you've got your main character who always has the answer to the problem and everyone admires them. And they laugh at his jokes and the women are secretly but also very obviously attracted to him. All of them. All of them. There is no exception. Mm -hmm. No. I think everybody agrees that The Name of the Wind, while an excellent book, is that. I've never read it. I will agree. Thank you. I'll name and shame one. Ready Player One. I think that is a <gasps> massive is abuser of that trope and it is, I think, one of my least favorite books I've ever read. No way. Really? Tell me why. I don't like anything that happens in <laughs> yeah, that's a good reason. He gets the first... I forget what it is, but he passes the first test. And then all of a sudden he is this world famous Giga Chad chilling on a space station. And from that moment on, he kind of loses all relatability because it's like I just said, he always has the answer. He's always like, this is obviously a reference to obscure eighties film over there. And everyone's like, Parcival, you're a genius. I want to have sex with you. We all want to have sex with you. Oh, that's beautiful. That's one of your least favorite books. What's your favorite book? I think that statistically speaking, the uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy <gasps> series are probably my favorite, just because I was going to recommend that I've series. Actually... It's my favorite. It's one of my favorites too. Really? Did you, you like all five? There's Hitchhiker's Guide. There's Restaurant to the End of the Universe. There's like So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. I'm not sure if I've read all five actually then. It's okay. You remembered all the important ones. The joke is that it's the only trilogy told in five parts and <laughs> I know, right? And then I jokingly say it's just a trilogy because the other two parts really don't need to be read. I feel like if there's a very efficient way to start a fight in the book community, mm -hmm. it's just to bring up audiobooks. <laughs> Are they books? Is it reading? Can you read an audio book or do you listen to an audio book? Right. And is it um, cheating to listen mm -hmm, to an audio mm -hmm, book and then mm -hmm. say that you have read it? Right. So the correct answer is obviously that it does not count. It is cheating. <laughs> it's not reading. Why is it not reading? <sighs> Some stupid... Who knows? I don't care. <laughs> I can tell you because uh, oh, I stumbled good. upon a, uh, a Reddit thread. Oh, that, uh, good. This delightful post on it. Far too often people brag how they read 200 to 300 <laughs> books a year. <laughs> Actually, just listen to audiobooks for the most part. Then they get offended when confronted with the fact that listening to an audiobook is not reading. It's listening to someone reading a book for you. It's not reading it for yourself. Reading requires an active involvement on your part. Listening is something passive that can be done while doing other things. It's like arguing that a toddler that gets read a book to, by its mother is still indeed, did indeed read it, which is absurd. 
Absolutely absurd. I personally don't count the books that I read. I don't like keep a tally. So you're not a competitive reader. I'm not a competitive reader. So if I if I'm talking about books, I do say listen to this one on audiobook just in case somebody cares. Are you the type of person that would have a problem with say, you know, me, some pleb off the street coming up to you and going, I read this book the other day and then you discover that I actually listened to it. Do you semantically have a problem with that? No, I don't care because <laughs> that's the correct answer to most questions. <laughs> I understand people getting caught up on the semantics. And if that's the case, clarify when you're talking. I think it is painfully semantic. For example, if you watched a movie with the sound off and the subtitles on, do you say that you read the movie or did you watch it? Good point. Are anime watchers actually anime watchers or are they readers? I think they're all readers. <laughs> I tricked the entire anime and manga community into being the book community just now. When it comes to stuff like vision impaired people, have they not read the book because they didn't, you know, they can't read, but you, but you also wouldn't say oh I fingered that book the other day. Oh Liam no you wouldn't say that. I think it does come down to a weird competitive nature because a lot of what it seems to boil down to is I the reader did something active you the listener did sweet fuck all. You <laughs> sat there and let someone else do the work right, right. that's what I think a lot of it comes down to. I think a lot of it is to do with the, the initial bit that he posted about too. These people that claim to read these many books know they I didn't. I read half those books or a quarter of that that number, but I did it the right way. You took the shortcut. If someone takes a train across the United States and another person takes a plane, they both start in the same place, they both get to the same place. It just feels like a waste of time to go, you cheated because you flew. I took the train. And then someone else will go, you cheated. You took the train. I, I walked. walked. <laughs> right. So by those same standards, if somebody were to come up to you and say, oh, hey, did you drive here? And you were in the passenger seat, would you say, yeah, we drove? Or would you say, no, I didn't. I came by car, <laughs> but I didn't drive. I didn't drive. I passively accepted <laughs> someone else driving me. Exactly. Just so we're clear. It took no effort on my part. I sat there like a mind numb <laughs> human. Except that same person would never say that because they would never be able to admit to doing something passively. They'd be like, yeah, we drove. I helped. <laughs> I helped. I was an active part <laughs> participant. <laughs> The Guinness World Record for speed reading is apparently held by a man named Howard Berg. He can read, I say allegedly because I do not believe this shit. Allegedly he can read up to 80 pages mm -hmm. per minute mm -hmm. and retain a 90% it. comprehension mm, rate. That is, that is what's said. What he's doing here is reading a 1,500 uh, page Senate bill mm -hmm. live on the news. I've seen this video. He's not reading. Look at it. <laughs> he's just oh, gosh, taking pages so and throwing it on the floor. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no reading occurring here. I refuse <laughs> to believe that. I, this, this is madness. Yeah, it is kind of wild too because technique wise, does he read bottom to top? Because he's covering the bottom by the time he should be getting he to is. the bottom. Yeah, he's covering all of the page. I guess. Yeah, like he would have to start at the bottom and work his way up for that to work. He would have to read backwards. What? <laughs> <laughs> I reckon he read it the night before and this is all just a show. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to make judgments on his life. I am. There's also a lot of research that indicates that speed reading is not effective for retention and it only stores in your short-term memory but it cannot lock into the long-term memory unless you are reading immersively and not using speed reading techniques. Great. So he's read like say 300,000 books but he doesn't remember any of them. <laughs> Excellent. A wonderful use of your time, sir. <laughs> Sure, why not? He got the Guinness Book of World Records. Did you know that there is a record for the slowest selling book in the world? <gasps> really? The world's slowest selling book. It is David Wilkins's translation of the New Testament. It was translated from Coptic into Latin. Uh huh. It was printed in 1716 and has sold a total of 500 copies over the course of 191 years that it remained in print. Is this why you think that things are just published willy dilly? <laughs> I mean, maybe. I definitely know that this guy made the wrong bet on assuming that Latin would be a prominent language going forward. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Guinness also has a bunch of what I'm gonna call shit records. Mm. There is a record for fastest marathon one whilst dressed as a book. Well, okay. I thought you were going to say while reading. Nope. 
not that impressive. I'm sorry. I would like to know why this is more impressive than running a marathon while reading. So this is Hannah Holt, and she is actually the world record holder of the female division. What? Meanwhile, <laughs> this is Aaron Gons, and he is the world record holder for the male division. He's not wearing it. He was wearing mm -hmm. it. He's taken it off. I want to beat the record now. This seems like something I should do. Uh, sure. Let's say you're running a marathon tomorrow. What book do you dress as and why? Peter Pan, because it's my favorite book. Okay, so the way I'm thinking about this is if I was running the marathon, I would pick something maybe in the kids book section why? with not a lot of pages. Maybe something like The Very Hungry Caterpillar, <laughs> just because because I feel like if I was to go for something full fantasy like Lord of the Rings, then you're being weighed down by the sheer detail of Middle Earth. I'm pretty sure these people are just wearing the covers. Well, then that is not correct. Well, Peter Pan's not a long book. It's longer than The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and I reckon I'd beat you in a race if we were both dressed as our respective books. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. How good of a runner are you? Because I can run for like 10 minutes without stopping. I can run for 11. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Snorting a gusty billow of mirth, he once more concealed the tiny object beneath his loincloth. I want you to know that the is, is T-H space E. <laughs> the, the, the tiny objects beneath his loincloth, the tremendously honed pelvis bone of the broken rodent. I just found one. Take hold of this rope, said the first soldier, and climb out from your pit, slut. <laughs> Your presence is required in another far deeper hellhole. <laughs> Imagine helping someone out of a pit. I mean, come on, slut. <laughs> the slut should have picked his quarry more carefully, roared the victor in a mocking baritone growl. <laughs> He does, and it's not being used for a woman, I believe. The slut should have picked his quarry more carefully. Oh. So people are just very casually tossing it around. Maybe it's just like one of those people that's like, hey, slut, let's go. Yeah, He I just guess, calls yeah. All, his, all his friends slut. Yeah, come on, slut. Let's have a Out of time. your pits, slut. <laughs> come on. Your presence is requested in a far deeper pit. It's like, it was just the lingo of the time. We just don't understand because we're too modern. If this video were a book, how would you end it? By closing the cover. <laughs>